Welcome to part two of our discussion on Kashmir. We are joined today by Professor Muhammad Janaid, who is a Kashmiri scholar, activist, and cultural anthropologist. He is also assistant professor at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Janaid. So continuing our conversation, and we sort of left off of sort of talking about Kashmiri aspirations, because again, most of the discourse around Kashmir and what should happen to Kashmir is centered around Pakistani and Indian perspectives. So you've talked talked a little bit about what Kashmiri aspirations are and is primarily for independence and like an independent entity. Um, can you talk a little bit about the role of the plebiscite that was um, sort of introduced way back in 1947 and then in various um, UN Security Council resolutions that the people of Kashmir through a referendum should be able to decide what their future should be. Um, and Initially, I believe in 1949, India had tried to hold that plebiscite, but India and Pakistan could not agree to the rules of the plebiscite. If it does happen, it will have to happen in all of Kashmir. So Pakistani administered Kashmir and also Indian administered Kashmir. Now, this is something that Pakistan has over the years pushed for as well. And I'm wondering what your notion is in terms of what Kashmiris think about having a plebiscite. Is that something that still resonates with them? And is that a realistic option to pursue? Um, so the as I said, the accession of um, the Maharaja, not Kashmiris, but the Maharaja with the Indian state uh, was conditioned on the fact that there would be a referendum. Yes. Um, this as this was reflected later on when India took the case to the United Nations mm -hmm. uh, and it was reflected in UN Security Council Resolution 47. It called for several steps. One was the immediate ceasefire between India and Pakistan, which mm -hmm. took place in 1949. Yeah. Uh, it uh, called for demilitarization on both sides. Um, I, on Pakistani side, it was supposed to be complete. Mm -hmm. On the Indian side, it was supposed to uh, leave a minimum number of troops main to, uh, enough to maintain law and order, but very minimum and gr uh, eventually full demilitarization. And finally, the holding of plebiscite under uh, UN auspices. Now, um, this would have taken place, the ceasefire took place, but demilitarization took, did not take place. Mm. Demilitarization would have taken place on the Pakistani side if India had agreed that they would hold a plebiscite. Mm -hmm. As soon as uh, the you know, ceasefire took place, India started uh, retracing its steps and um, did not accept Kashmir as uh, um, kind of a dispute. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, it started negotiating with um, national conference leadership to um, find constitutional ways to integrate um, Kashmir with India. Mm -hmm. The Article 370 that you mentioned earlier was simply a reflection of those negotiations mm -hmm. and carried some of the spirit of the accession, uh, uh, the three areas that I mentioned earlier, defense, you know, communication and external affairs. Yes. Um, and while Sheikh Abdullah, the leader of National Conference, had assumed that India was going to hold a plebiscite, India never conducted a plebiscite in mm -hmm. Kashmir. And it clearly had no intention of conducting mm -hmm. such a plebiscite because in 1953 it immediately um, you know, arrested Sheikh Abdullah on the charges that he was conspiring sure. um, to you know, claim independence. Um, since that time, Kashmiris have, uh, of course, you know, um, spoken about plebiscite as the bedrock of their politics in mm -hmm. many ways because the, what the, uh, the UN Security Council resolutions did was it acknowledged Acknowledge Kashmiris as a people, right. you know, uh, that they were visible in that resolution, mm -hmm. which means that their will had to be, ex you know, uh, registered. Sure. Now, how that will was supposed to be registered could be done in variety of ways. If India and Pakistan had agreed yeah. that that will would be, uh, you know, paramount, mm -hmm. the will of Kashmiris as it should have been, sure. uh, then it could be done regionally, it could have been done. Um, you know, across different boundaries. I mean, and from that time on, you have had many solutions. We know that Kashmir, the historic state of Kashmir, was also geographically diverse. Yeah. In some parts, like uh, what was called Kilgit Baltistan, majority may have favored to remain part of uh, Pakistan. Sure. And what became Jammu after the massacres yeah. of 1947, perhaps may want to be, the Hindu majority area may want to be remain yeah. part of India. Yeah. and. Um, but rest of the state uh, could have perhaps either, you know, if they wanted to decide to go to Pakistan, decide to go with India or remain independent. Right, right. You know, so 
Um, there are a variety of solutions. Different uh, configurations, pos configurations where possible. And so you think that can still actually happen if we have regional, um, you know, sort of referen like mini referendums within the different sub regions of Kashmir, both Pakistan administered and Kashmir administered, that can still happen. That does, I mean, that is something that is consider a realistic option even today yes I mean why shouldn't it be sure. I mean uh, it's a huge territory you know um, uh, it has a long history of um, being autonomous and independent yeah. uh, it is a pluralistic place um, and it can govern itself yeah. you know and um, there should be no problem in assuming that it's not realistic. The, uh, I mean, I think the only unrealistic thing is to assume that the present state of war will continue forever. Right. I mean, uh, you know, you have two countries, India and Pakistan, who are like at each other's throats, uh, both armed with nuclear weapons. And, you know, I mean, we know as Kashmiris that if that war took place, well, that will mm. happen, sure. you know, and um, it's bleeding both countries. These are like some of the poorest countries in the world you know despite all the um, hoopla about you know gdps and whatnot mm -hmm. they are really poor and they're spending fortunes on to hold on to yeah. to hold on to a region that does not want to be part of them absolutely and so when we're talking again about the kashmiri people and their aspirations and when you imagine an independent entity you would imagine something that includes both pakistan administered kashmir and indian administered kashmir right or are you imagining independence just for indian administered kashmir i'd like for you to sort of talk a little bit about the relations between kashmiris on the Indian side of the border and those on the Pakistani side of the border and whether there's any cross LOC you know contacts are there uh, families that have been broken up because of this line of control and uh, what would they like to see in terms of more relations um, sort of uh, increasing in the next few years um, so um, listening to activists and scholars who have worked in what is called Azad Kashmir, uh, Azad, which is, Pakistan you know, which is the Pakistani administrative side of Kashmir, um, there is a diversity of views. Some people uh, see the condition of Kashmiris on the other side and think they they probably lucked out and are with uh, uh, with Pakistan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a number of other groups uh, and um, you know people on that side might think uh, actually express a desire to unify with Kashmir and create an independent uh, space yeah. in a independent country on, on their own. Um, there, that region has also a diversity of uh, people. There are Kashmiri-speaking people, there are Bahari-speaking uh, people, um, and they have a history of staying together, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, 1947 did break uh, families like you know you had a house here the line was drawn by the this military conflict and your lands were on this side mm -hmm. there are a lot of people who have been displaced uh, in fact from 1990 to 2015 uh, more than 35,000 people have been displaced from in 1965 to 1971 wars yeah. another 50,000 were displaced right. not to mention the half a million I mentioned earlier sure. you know in 1947 yes. um, so yeah this is uh, this line of control is artificial it divides families it you know bisects a region that has a history of being together yeah and there was I mean there have been multiple rounds of negotiations between India and Pakistan around Kashmir I think that perhaps the one that went farthest was the one in 2006 uh, between Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and um, President Pervez Musharraf and they had sort of talked about sort of making this line of control a soft border where people from Kashmiris from both sides of the border could sort of you know interact with one another they could have free trade there could be a lot of freedom of movement of people and that they would sort of both countries would draw down their military forces because of domestic turmoil that Pervez Musharraf was uh, experiencing because of something completely separate uh, those negotiations were then derailed. Um, do you think that is something that would be acceptable to the Kashmiri people? As an interim solution, so everything is could be on the table. You know, mm -hmm. there is there are no hard lines. Um, of course, this is not a permanent situation. Um, you know, we know uh, that no solution um, can be imposed on Kashmiris where they don't have a say. Right. So yeah. I wanted to actually ask about that. So, I mean, there have been so many multiple rounds of negotiations between the two countries. Have they included Kashmiri voices, Kashmiri civil society, Kashmiri leaders within those uh, discussions, those dialogues? Uh, no. Um, 
So, I mean, Kashmir is like still like, you know, even in Pakistan, uh, imagined as a bilateral dispute within between India and Pakistan, you know, or internationally it's seen as an international dispute between India and Pakistan. But really, it's a dispute between Kashmiris on one side and Pakistan and India on the other side, mm. you know, and um, Kashmiri people and all the peoples of Kashmir, not just Kashmiri Muslims, um, have demanded a uh, seat at the table that you know you sit on the other side and um, so resolve your issues but you have to negotiate with us uh, because we are the primary party to this question right. I mean it's our land it's our uh, history it's our people it's our future that you are discussing and we cannot let you your bureaucrats decide our fate right. um, even in those negotiations that you mentioned between Manmohan Singh and Pervez Musharraf there was hardly any input from Kashmiris mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know and those solutions are not workable sure, they're, not sustainable. Uh, they're not sustainable because um, Kashmiris do not give um, the assent to such um, imposed um, you know solutions and is there any coordination between you know um, Kashmiris that are elected to um, the state assembly in Pakistan administered Kashmir and those in not necessarily the political leadership in Kashmir but other you know resistance leaders um, is there any coordination in terms of like you know having a united front to sort of put forth if such negotiations were to take place and they were invited or do you feel like there is not that much collaboration around those things I don't know how much legitimacy the Pakistani and Mr. Kashmir uh, Assembly has mm -hmm. in that region. Uh, in Indian control side, it has very limited uh, yeah. leg legitimacy too. Um, in both, on both sides, to yeah. be able to contest elections, you have to pledge allegiance to the Indian or the Pakistani constitution. Right. You know, I mean, um, y when you are contesting sovereignty yes. in this region and you pledge allegiance to the sovereignty of these countries, mm -hmm. you clearly are not representing the interests of your own people. Right, right. Uh, yeah, you know, so you, I don't think, uh, I mean, not that there is any coordination possible, mm. uh, you know. Um, I don't think they have um, a fully representative character. Right. So let's talk about Pakistan for a second, because we've talked uh, quite a bit about India and India's role in Indian administered Kashmir. So Pakistan has one third of the territory, right, that it's had since 1947. And so not only does it control that, but it has, since the very beginning, been very much involved in what's happening in Indian administered Kashmir as well. Um, and so, right, I mean, again, from when the, in October 1947, when Bataan tribesmen went into Kashmir, and there was a lot of looting and plundering that was done, it's still somewhat debatable whether the Pakistani government was behind it or the military or whether it was just like, a, you know, a spontaneous sort of movement of these Bataan tribesmen into Kashmir. And then in 1965, there was also um, Operation Gibraltar that was orchestrated by the Pakistani military, where it sent in 30,000 military and paramilitary forces that then triggered the 1965 war and then again in 1999 Kargil happened again when there was incursion by Pakistani military forces into um, Indian administered Kashmir. So I'd like to sort of ask what Kashmiris think about Pakistan's role um, in Indian administered Kashmir and then we can also talk a little bit about how Pakistan governs its own um, territory of Kashmir. But if you could talk about how Kashmiris feel about Pakistan's role, has it hindered or helped their, their sort of movement for self-determination? Um, can you give us an evaluation of that? Um, yeah, so, I mean, of course, uh, Pakistan is not an external ex uh, actor in this case, you know. Uh, it has interests in the peace in the region it, because uh, some of the most vital resources is water, water flows right. from Kashmir into Pakistan yeah. and in recent years and for a pretty long time India has kind of threatened Pakistan with um, blocking that water mm -hmm. um, which will be devastating um, downstream. Sure. Um, uh, Pakistan has launched some, as you mentioned, several of these um, incursions which have mostly been unsuccessful and uneventful. Um, the, I mean, I do want to push back against the initial, the so-called Kabaili raid uh, and that looting and plundering. Mm -hmm. uh, I think some of that may have been um, disorganized um, and chaos in the, uh, that was taking place, but a lot of that representation is an Indian representation of that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, of course they were interested in 
presenting them as um, um, you know savage rebels. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I mean, well, it's just to make a case for their own military intervention in in Kashmir. Uh, Indian military actions in Kashmir have been no less loot, plundering and oh, looting course, as well. Of course. Um, you know, for Kashmiris, um, Pakistan has been. Um, partly nuisance mm -hmm. uh, because uh, Kashmiris uh, think that uh, Pakistan does not understand Kashmir very well. Right. They are unaware of Kashmir's history, our unique cultural traditions, our, you know, we're not part of that partition logic. Yeah. You know, we, we don't think in necessarily in terms of Hindus and Muslims. Our aspirations were different. Yeah. Uh, they were not, uh, yes, we were suppressed as Muslims um, by the Hindu Maharaja, but mm -hmm. these struggles were also class-based, yeah. you know. Um, so our aspirations from 1940s, uh, 30s onwards have been very different from the Pakistani uh, elite aspirations. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, we also know that India is not a benign power, you know, especially with the rise of Hindu nationalism. I mean, and that story goes way back um, to the 19, uh, late 19th century and early 20th century mm -hmm. and the formation of India itself. Sure. Uh, uh, we know um, from the very beginning that uh, Indian nationalism has acted malignant in Kashmir um, uh, tried to squelch away, take away any shred of our autonomy of our, um, you know, and our rights. And for, for those reasons, many Kashmiris think of Pakistan as like an ally, mm -hmm. you know, that mm -hmm. which has our back. Yeah. Like India would have, for instance, gobbled us up like the Chinese did in, in uh, Xinjiang and yeah. everywhere if the Pakistani state hadn't been there. Um, so it's like this twin di dilemma mm -hmm. that we have. On one side, we know that Pakistan is indispensable, otherwise India is gonna completely absorb us and take you know, take away our, all of our lands and resources. Yeah. On the other hand, we know that the Pakistani elite and its military uh, is acts gormlessly about Kashmir. Like, you know, um, it, its support, seems to be tied up with this notion that Kashmir Panega Pakistan, which means yes. Kashmir will become Pakistan. Right. Uh, I, and I think that's self-defeating. Nobody on, in the world understands that logic. Right. Why would Kashmir become Pakistan? Right, but that is a narrative that is dominant in Pakistani society and what we've grown up with. And, um, and I feel like that really suppresses the voice of the independent Kashmiri voice that needs to come through and doesn't often in uh, Pakistani society. Um, so also, when we let's talk about Pakistan administered Kashmir as well. I don't know whether you've ever been there. Uh, you grew up in um, on the other side, but um, what do you, again, you, you had sort of mentioned this a little bit earlier about um, that assembly or people who are elected over there. There's a 53 member assembly on the Pakistani side that is elected as a uni um, cameral legislature. Um, and, but you believe that it is, um, doesn't have a lot of legitimacy. So can you sort of elaborate on that? Um, I didn't mean to say that it does not have any legitimacy, um, but um, what I know is that to be um, to be able to contest elections in that, on that side of the border, yeah. you have to pledge allegiance to Pakistan. Right. You cannot be uh, a member of a party that seeks independence uh, and unification. Sure. Uh, so in in that. At Contest, that level, right, um, right. it does not really. Uh, I mean, I don't know how much they represent the aspirations of, of those people. Sure, you know, sure. but in terms of like, you know, uh, are they representative? Are the elections free and fair? Perhaps, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, in in terms of like whether they will be able to be on the negotiating table discussing Kashmir sovereignty at some point. Yeah. I don't know if they will be. They will. They will have any legitimacy to be speaking as Kashmiris. Sure. You sure. know, uh, in the same way, like the legislative assembly in Kashmir and will they have a place on the table negotiating Kashmiri mm -hmm. sovereignty how can they when they so have aligned themselves with the Indian state sure 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 and uh, also on the Pakistani side you've also heard and there have been reports of you know Kashmiri activists who've been um, intimidated harassed and subject to surveillance if they have aspired for an independent Kashmir so that's something that's also um, ongoing um, so I'd like to sort of end with again the aspirations of the Kashmiri people where do you think um, the best hope for self-determination lies when it comes to the people of Kashmir is it through the political process is it through India-Pakistan negotiations is it through a plebiscite um, or is it in the, the the resistance movement itself, where do you think um, where do you think the best hope for the Kashmiri people lies? 
Um, so I think the hope lies in, in South Asia itself. Like we have to reimagine South Asia. You know, of course, India and Pakistan war can continue forever. You know, I mean, they are willing to uh, and and highlight each other. Uh huh. Um, I'm so sorry about this. Yes. Um, the hope lies in a South Asian context where uh, the two countries are um, not at loggerheads with each other. They're not at each other's throats. Uh, and I mean, and so the solution is regional. You know, um, Kashmiri independence cannot survive on its own, mm -hmm. you know, if India and Pakistan do not come to an agreement. Um, Kashmiri resistance um, is at present defensive. Mm -hmm. You know, the Kashmiris are trying to defend themselves. Um, they're not trying to hurt anyone. Um, they are under assault, um, you know, from the Indian state primarily right now. And so that's what they're trying to do, defend themselves. Um, we have to reimagine South Asia. It's a place of great poverty. It's a great a place of great inequality. India itself is like the one of the most unequal societies in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been taken over by a vicious um, ideology of the Hindutva, while the Pakistani uh, state itself has flirted with um, Islamist uh, groups at different times, um, and none of them provide hope for the people mm -hmm. anywhere in, in that region. And um, so um, Kashmiris are hoping, and this is, I mean, this is what I believe um, a majority of the people in Kashmir think that the solution to the you know, issue of Kashmir lies if India and Pakistan kind of become better, you know, that they, instead of like hurting each other, they kind of try to turn inwards and look at the problems that they are facing. Right, right. You know, that instead of becoming, buying weapons from all of these countries who are egging them on, uh, spending valuable resources and material resources on things like that, that they just withdraw, you know. India does not need to occupy Kashmir. Right, You know, right. India does not need to spend its fortune uh, like holding on to a territory that does not want to be part of it. Right, and right, and but with the BGP administration as it currently stands, do you feel like there's any hope for change, any hope for dialogue or negotiations, either with the Kashmiri leadership or with Pakistan? Um, well, these formations like RSS, BJP, and all of these, they've also they they emerge also as an as an effect of what is happening. You know, the way nationalism has emerged in South Asia, in especially India, right. in um, as a as an ideology opposed to um, not only Pakistan, not only Kashmiris, but Indian Muslims uh, themselves. Right. You know, so it defines now itself against the interests of Muslims. Um, and therefore, I mean, but and we know that uh, between Pakistan, Kashmir, and Indian Muslims, this is a population of around uh, probably 400 million people. Right. And how can that last? How can that um, uh, continue? You know, we are talking about one fifth of the world's population here. Right. <laughs> you know, um, it's so it's self defeating. And um, I don't have any hope, of course, with Modi. You know, he's just the worst not nightmare that has happened to India itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, we as Kashmiris, we've faced the Indian state in its various manifestations. We've seen yeah. the Indian crackdowns before. Um, this is not new, yes. you know. Uh, but it is, I think that India itself is like facing an existential crisis right now right. under Modi and Hindutva. Do you think with the, all of the conflict that's happening, communal um, um, uh, issues that have erupted in um, India after the citizenship laws and uh, with you know Muslims being attacked and targeted more recently, uh, people are no longer focused as much on Kashmir? Um, it, perhaps, you know, in, um, I think that in, in, in the West where attention spans run low, um, it may be the case, but uh, Kashmir has always um, like not attracted too much attention in the West, right. you know, unless right. like India and Pakistan are, are at the brink of a nuclear war. Right. Um, so, I mean, but that has not, that have not determined the d dynamics of 
the Kashmir issue. Right. You know, Kashmir issue is not an issue because of media attention. Yeah. Kashmir issue is an issue because of the Kashmiri mm. people Human demanding rights. their rights and demanding their political and economic and social rights. Um, so, um, yes, that may be the case. But the new protests in uh, India, the, these, the assault on and the pogroms against Muslims, especially the recent pogrom in, in Delhi, only go on to show that, you know, uh, the state of exception that has been created in Kashmir, the violence that has been honed in, uh, you know, in Kashmir is now being exported to India itself. Right. And train, the guns are now being trained on uh, minorities, Dalits, Muslims, sure. you know. So same tactics that were used in Kashmir are now being used elsewhere, which is, um, which I think should wake up if there are any reasonable Indians left, which I believe are many of them, um, they should fight it tooth and nail and not let their country slide, you know, into fascism. As, as it has, it seems like it's like almost falling off the deep end. I know, and we can only imagine where this, all of this will end, but we can only hope and pray that the Kashmiri people find the self-determination that they've been fighting so hard for for the past 73 years. So on that note, we'd have to conclude our program. Thank you so much, Professor Janet, for your insights. And um, with that, we will end our program today. Thank you so much for joining us.